What is a fallacy? Wow, I really suck as a teacher, don't I? What is a fallacy? What? What's wrong? Is that what you said? When something's wrong? No. Fallacies can be correct. Yes. I didn't hear you. That's right. That's right. It's an error in reasoning. You came up with the conclusion the wrong way. The conclusion may be right. We just came about it the wrong way. An error in reasoning. So these are all some fallacies that are rhetorical devices, but they're fallacies. They're attempts to manipulate, persuade, get people to change their position, and they do so in a way that's fallacious. <coughs> So, let's talk about them. First off, ad hominem. Ad hominem fallacy. The ad hominem fallacy is when you attack the source. Remember we talked in the class about uh, that all, all uh, claims out there, when you, when you attack the validity of a claim, you can look at either the claim itself or the source of the claim, right? And so, ad hominem is when you would attack the source of the claim instead of the claim. So somebody can make a claim and you can say, oh yeah? Say, let's say somebody says, uh, I believe that President Trump has done a good good job managing the economy. Response? Oh yeah, you're an idiot. He's gone bankrupt. I'm sorry. They say he's gone bankrupt. Yeah. Well, that we can address that one in just a second. But if the response is, if the response is, oh yeah, you're an idiot. Do you see how the response wasn't in any way addressing the claim itself? You just attack the person. It's a personal attack. Oh yeah, you're stupid. You're ugly. You don't know what you're talking about. A lot of people think that that's a legitimate way to refute a claim, to attack the person making it. But critical thinkers know the difference. Next one. Inconsistent ad hominem. So you get the personal attack ad hominem, you've got the inconsistent ad hominem. This is when you attack the person for being inconsistent with their claim. So with Hillary Clinton, for a long time she was against gay marriage. In fact, her whole life she was against gay marriage until she ran for president and then she was for gay marriage. The Republicans that were running against her said, aha! You're inconsistent in your claims. First you're for it, now you're against it. That's one example of inconsistency. Cha challenging somebody because they've changed their position. Another one is if they do one thing and say something else. This is something that we as a society, one of my pet peeves, is that we as a society thinks that this is the worst sin we can commit. To be a hypocrite. Inconsistent ad hominem is the idea that you're a hypocrite. If you can catch somebody on being a hypocrite, then that means you can disregard what they say. Don't we believe that? That's, that's a fallacy. What they say still may be very, very true. One that I used to hear all the time is in the 80s. A big, a big 
political issue in the 80s was family values. The Republicans were talking about how the family is breaking down in America, we need to promote stronger families and stronger family values. It's an important thing for there to be strong families in our country and strong family values. And the Democrats would just wait for somebody to have a family problem. They go, oh, Mr. Family Values all of a sudden turns out that his daughter got pregnant. Uh-huh. So now, now where's your family values? As if somehow that refutes the claim that strong families make a good country, right? Or another thing that happened in the 80s. Preachers were going around saying, family values, family values, morals and ethics. You should not cheat on your spouse. You should love your wife. You should treat people well. And then the preacher was arrested for soliciting a prostitute. Does that in any way change the claims that you should love your wife and be loyal to your wife and treat your family well? No. But for some reason we think, aha, gotcha. Now everything you said is false because you're a hypocrite. You see how that's wrong? It's a fallacy. Everything they said still could be true. This is my pet peeve, is that we think hypocrisy is the greatest sin. We think that as long as somebody admits they're a scumbag, then it's okay for them to be a scumbag. And in fact, that person is better than the person who says that they're not a scumbag. Perfect example of this is Bill Clinton. Hey, we all love Bill Clinton. Why? Because he admits he's a scumbag. So it's okay for him to sexually harass women and cheat on his wife and do all the horrible things that Bill Clinton does because he never held himself out as being a good person. We love rock stars because we know that they're scumbags and they don't hold themselves out as being good people. And we think, well, at least they're honest. But the reality is being a hypocrite is a good thing. It's an extremely good thing. Well, you know what it means? It means you have standards higher than you live. I hope. I hope we all are hypocrites and I hope we all have standards higher than we live. And we're striving to do that. Right? Would you rather, let's say you're doing your will. You've got two sisters you can leave your kids to. One of your sisters, you know, smokes pot from time to time, but does it on the DL. None of her kids know about it. Eh, once in a while she'll go do it. The other sister does it all the time and brings the kids in and teaches them how to roll joints and, you know, in, in kindergarten and <coughs> promotes it in the household. Would you rather leave your children to the one who, if that's the only difference, the one who teaches the kids not to do drugs but then does it on the DL, or the one that is not a hypocrite? I'd rather leave them to the hypocrite. At least they're going to teach the kids not to, in theory, right? So, Again, this idea that you can, you can discount everything somebody says just by finding them doing one thing contrary to what they say is the fallacy. And it's an it's a inconsistency ad hominem. The last example that I like is there's a girl standing up in class. She's a freshman in high school, and she's giving a speech in her five-minute speech class, in her public speaking class, and she's giving her speech on why you should wait until you are married to have sex and she's eight months pregnant. <laughs> Does it discount anything she's saying? It could be a warning to you. It's a warning. Right? It doesn't discount anything, but you can see somebody in the audience elbowing going, why are we listening to her? She's knocked up, right? We, we have this problem where we think it's okay for us to discount people because they're hypocrites. Uh, it's, it's annoying to me. But there is that. Okay, next one. Circumstantial ad hominem. Yes, sir. Yes, about the last one, like, that, like, you know, I told you my background, like, you had to be careful. When you're in a position, any kind of position of leadership, right, you have to be super careful, like, 
I every Friday, you know, talk to all the guys standing in front of me. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't drink. And, and God help you, you get caught. You know, you and, get, and by the way, so people don't know what you're talking about. What 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 leadership position are you talking about? I was in the military. Obviously. That's right. Okay. So I knew that, but I didn't know. Yeah. That. I was in the military, obviously. And every Friday, you give the you know, don't do anything stupid speech. Don't don't drink and drive. Don't obviously not don't beat your spouse. Don't crash your motorcycle. That was a huge one. How sad you have to say all those things. But go yeah, ahead. Every week, you have to say the same thing every Friday. But then you have to make sure that God help you, you get caught doing any of those things that you, you know what I'm saying? And again, it's just a warning, shit. I, I've been in this game for a minute. I, I'm at a point that, okay, they'll, sell, they'll make me leave and I'll go on, on my happy way. But you just started, so I'm trying to help you not, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But you couldn't. Yeah, you, and if you got caught, then they would all think, now it's now okay it's for me to me do it. it. Because he was doing it. You know? Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, which is sad, but we, we, have that, we have that problem. We believe this fallacy. Quite a bit, yes. Would you say that's the in politics that flip flopper? Yeah, flip floppers is a lot of times what, what people will will accuse somebody of is you know like the Hillary she flip flopped on that idea. And the reality is just like in politics in life is the same way. Hopefully you are going to be flip flopping in your life about things. I hope so. It means you're smarter today than you were yesterday, and you'll be smarter tomorrow than you are today. If you don't grow and change your positions on things, you're an idiot. It means you've peaked at whatever age you're at, and that's not a good thing. So it's, it's and when you argue with somebody, you're trying to convince them to change their position. Hopefully you're open-minded enough to change yours if you're asking other people to change theirs, right? So yeah, flip-flopping is a good, good, good point on that. Okay, next one, circumstantial ad hominem. Circumstantial ad hominem is similar to inconsistent ad hominem, but it's different in that it's attacking somebody because of their circumstances, not because of their actions. Circu in inconsistent is your actions are different than what you're claiming. Circumstances is your circumstances malign what you're saying. So let me give you an example, because you're going, what the hell are you talking about? Is, let's say somebody is explaining why abortion is wrong and all the reasons why he believes abortion is wrong. And then you respond by saying, well, wait a second, you're a Catholic priest, you're supposed to believe that. You see how you're not addressing the claims being made about abortion that he's making? What you're doing is you're attacking his circumstances and saying, the only reason he believes that is because he's a priest, so he has to believe that. You're attacking the circumstances instead of the claims being made. Another one would be, Somebody says, you know, I think you should vote, or you should, uh, well, vote is a good one. You know, you, let's, I, I actually said vote, but let, let's go with that. Let's say you, you're talking to Donald Trump Jr., and he says, I think President Trump has done a great job, and I think he'd be a great president uh, going forward to be reelected, and I think you should vote for him. And if you said, yeah, but you're just saying that because you're Donald Trump's son, you say, oh, that's a circumstantial ad hominem saying that, no, instead of addressing his claims, you're just saying your circumstances make it so that you are obviously biased. Or let's say you, um, uh, the reverse of it would be somebody who you know to be very, very poor, broke as hell, and says, you know, I think you should, uh, I think you should invest in ABC stock. I think ABC stock is going to go skyrocketing. And you say, why should I listen to you about soft advice? You're poor. You see how that's a circumstantial ad hominem. You're discounting what he says because he's poor. His circumstances make it so that you're discounting the claim that he's making, which is ABC stock is good stock to buy. What if you were to follow it up and say, do you buy stock? And if he said, oh yeah, I bought $10,000 of stock last year. And you say, okay, did you buy ABC stock? And if he says, no, 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 I bought XYZ stock instead. What fallacy have you committed if you were to say, well, then I'm not going to buy ABC stock because you haven't bought it? What fallacy is that? Inconsistency? Yes. You see the difference? So if you were to say, have you bought stock yet? Yeah. Do you buy ABC stock? 
no, I didn't buy it. Oh, well then, it must not be good stock. That's the inconsistency ad hominem. It still may be great stock, just because he didn't buy it doesn't mean it's not good stock. But you would think it isn't because he didn't buy it. So that's an inconsistent ad hominem. However, you say, he's poor, therefore I'm not going to buy it. That's circumstantial ad hominem. You see the difference, I hope. Next one, poisoning the well. Poisoning the well is when you attack somebody in advance. You say negative things about somebody in advance. So if I were to say, you know, remember when I introduced uh, Mr. Mallard about the ducks? If before I introduced him, I said, you know, I'm going to introduce somebody to you, and uh, he does drink a lot, and I think he cheats on his wife, and he's kind of a son of a bitch, and, <laughs> and uh, he likes to talk about ducks a lot, but that's just because he's a little insane. But uh, you probably shouldn't give him much credit in what he has to say, but I'll introduce him anyway. Mr. Mallard, come on in. And then you all go, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> That's poison the well. I poisoned in your mind. Then whatever he says, you're all going to go, uh-huh, yeah, yeah, sure, lush. Whatever he says is going to be tainted by what I said about him, right? People do this all the time in politics, all those commercials. There's probably times when you didn't even know who was running for something other than you see a negative commercial first, and you're like, it's some dark, menacing music. <laughs> And it shows a picture of the person in some black and white where they do some weird thing with their face, you know, that they capture the picture and they say, Mr. Jones hates children. Mr. Jones cheats on his wife. Do you really want Mr. Jones to be the next city councilman? You're like, who's Mr. Jones? I don't know, but I, I sure don't want him as the next city councilman, that's for sure. That's poisoning the well. So anytime you say something negative about somebody in advance and then encourage people to disregard what they have to say, you're committing the ad hominem fallacy of poisoning the well. Yes, ma'am. What if it's true? Is it still like, well, does it change it? That's a good question. No, it, it's still poisoning the well. You're wanting them to focus on the negative. Yeah, because you don't have to say it, right? Yeah. I mean, I can guarantee that I could take every single person in this room and get a list of negative things about them. Right? In fact, I could ask you, is there anything negative in your life ever? Yeah, sure. I mean, if you were honest, you could give me a list of, and I could, so anytime you do that in advance, you are, you're, you're doing that. You're poisoning the well. You know, if the point is to share negative things about somebody with the intent to lower somebody else's estimation of that person in advance of meeting them or knowing anything about them, you're poisoning the well. You're attacking them personally instead of the claims that they have to make. And this is, this is what the Democrats are going to do this time around to Trump. They, they can't run on the stuff that they normally run on. The economy, right? Black unemployment, Hispanic unemployment, women unemployment, all these things are at their historic best in the history of, the t of, of time. So how are you going to run against Trump? What has he done wrong as a president? Has he done any, can anybody think of anything, he's, any policy he's done or any act that has damaged the country there, or anything you would have done differently if you were the president or you think another better president would have done? Anybody? Separation of the kids and parents immigration. Okay. Obama did that before. That was started under Obama and he did that for many, many years before Trump did it and they attacked Trump for doing it. But, okay, separating the children. You, so you think the children shouldn't have been separated? They were separated from the Oh yeah, yeah, Obama was doing it. That, was, that policy that has been around for years. Yeah. And we stopped doing it, and you know what happened, by the way? I mean, this is totally different, but you know what happens? Is now, instead, children go with the parents, and you can't hold the children more than 72 hours or however long it is, and so you just release the whole family. And so what happens is all, all the, the, the people that are coming over illegally, they just, hi, they're hiring people to bring children over, and they just circle the children around, and they just bring them over each time, and then they get released, and they, you know. But, okay, so that's one thing that you didn't think you shouldn't have done, is, but that's not really a... a policy that he did. He was enforcing the law. That's what the law says. Congress wrote that law. He was enforcing it. But as far as something that he's done, that's one thing. Anybody else? Yeah. Tax cuts. Tax cuts. You don't think, you don't, you don't like the fact that there was tax cuts? Um, 
That's interesting. I mean, most people like getting more money in their but Okay, so you think... Well, I don't know. <clears throat> I think it's the fact that we did tax cuts, but we never really cut what we spent on at the same time. Okay. Like, so you don't like... It's not that you didn't like the tax cuts. It's that there should have been there spending, have been cuts, spending as well. cuts as well. I see. Time. Okay. Legitimate, legitimate gripe. Absolutely. Anybody, anybody else? Yes? I kind of think you could have handled the trade, trade war stuff with China a little bit better if you were the price. That's interesting. And I was the same way at first. I was, I was the same way at first. And I'm kind of coming around on this, by the way. Yeah, because it's getting a little better now, actually. Well, you know why? Because as an attorney, here's, here's, what, we, here's what we misunderstand, is we think that the position you're arguing for and that you're, you're taking a position on with negotiation is a position you want. Right? But he's doing it the way attorneys do it. You know the way I do it when I negotiate? If I want to get my client $100,000, you know what I ask for? Five. $200,000? Yeah, $500,000. Yeah, I want $500,000. Well, there's no way you're getting $500,000. Okay, you're right. I'm a $500,000 and I want your child. What? And screw you and I want your mother too. Keep messing with me and I'll just keep adding it up. And you push hard and you, you ask for the most absurd, outrageous thing. And then they're like, Wah. and then uh, number one, it puts out there the fact that that's a possibility and that we're talking those numbers in the first place. Number two, when you come down to that, then the other side thinks that they're getting a great deal because they beat you down to where you wanted to be in the first place, right? And so when Trump's going out there with Biden, he's saying, you son of a bitch, we're gonna, we're, we want a 22% tariff and we're gonna cut off everything. And, and we're like going, whoa, what, what are you doing? You're gonna kill our economy to do that. And he's going, shut up, shut up. Just leave me alone here, let me do it. And then they go, they panic and they cave in and then he doesn't do it. And we all go, oh, good thing he didn't do that. And I think, dude, he does it the way exactly, that's exactly how I would have done it if I didn't have the economy that could have collapsed, right? So I think he's got, it's kind of brilliant. In, at, at first I was like, you're an idiot, dude. You're, so I don't know, it, but that's the way it's kind of fallen out. But it's interesting. So, so some of the trade negotiations, possibly. But you see how it's, it's hard to find real big stuff, right? right? So what are they going to do? Attack him and all that other stuff. They're going to attack him personally. It's going to be all about him personally. His hair, his skin color, he's an idiot, he's a racist. He this, he that, he, 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 he. It's all going to be, you know, he cheats on his taxes, and he, and all, it'll be just be a personal tax about him because there's not much else you can do. The Democrats are going to go, it, it doesn't matter what I do, I won't be Trump. That's, that's their slogan. I won't be Trump. That's what they're going to run on. So it'll be interesting to see if that, if that resonates with America. It may. I don't know. I'm not Trump. Okay, so that's, in a nutshell, ad hominem. Attacking the person instead of the claims and the positions that the person takes. Questions about it? Okay, moving on. Burden of proof. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Let's, let's do this in the right order. Um, <coughs> let's talk about genetic fallacy next. Genetic fallacy. Genetic fallacy is the idea that occurs when we try to refute a claim or urge others to refute a claim based on the origin or history of the claim. We try to get to, to refute a claim or position based on its origin or history. The genetic fallacy is when you try to get someone to refute a claim or a position based on its origin or history. Or even a person, to dislike a person based on their origin or history. It works the same way. This is very common these days, that, the last one I said, where uh, you shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't like this person, this person is a horrible person because 20 years ago he told a joke, what happened with, what's, what's the comedian, the little short black dude? Kevin Hart. Kevin, Kevin Hart. Hart. Funny as hell. Kevin Hart um, was, he did, wasn't able to do the, the, uh, Oscars. the Oscars. Why? Yeah. 
Because he made some gay jokes uh, years ago. And he he, said, and, by the way, he didn't make gay jokes. What did he say? Do you, do you remember what he said? No, I don't know. I just, he talked about, he spoke about it on his radio show. He didn't say exact, because I don't think, at that point he wasn't going to repeat it. He refused to repeat it. He said that he'd addressed it and, he, and it was over. But I didn't hear what he originally said. I, I heard it. I, I listened to him. I, I heard what he said. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't mock gay people. But even if he did, you know what he is? <laughs> He's a comedian. You shut the fuck up. Are you kidding? He's a comedian. The whole point is you mock everybody. If a comedian can't mock <laughs> everybody, then what the hell are we doing in our country? Do there, there's people you can't mock? Really? Did you hear that they're trying? They're going to do a live. Uh... Uh, shit, All in the Family and the Jeffersons, they want to bring it back, and I'm like, hell no, that is not going to work. That's interesting. It's not going to work. We should be able to mock everybody. You can mock Trump, you can mock, you can mock anybody you want, except, except gays? I don't know, but he did it anyway, by the way. He didn't mock, what he said was, he was talking about his son. He said, you know, when my son was younger, and I went in his room, and he's playing with these Barbies, and I thought, whoa, what the hell are you doing, man, you can't, and he says, I, I, I was afraid my son was going to be gay. Oh yeah, he said, that's what he said. Don't do that. That's yeah. That's what he said, and people laughed. Uh, you know, typical like joking about how sometimes you overreact about stupid stuff like that as a parent. Oh, that was funny. That one is funny. And so, and so, he did it. Anyway, my point is, is he a horrible person because ten years ago he said a joke that somebody might be offended about? No. That's a genetic fallacy. Remember when, uh, what's his name, was running or was uh, going to be voted in as the new Supreme Court Justice? Kavanaugh? He should not be voted in because why? Because when he was in high school, allegedly he drank too much and groped a high school girl. 35 years ago was the claim. That's the genetic fallacy. You're telling me that he's unfit to be on the Supreme Court because even if it's true, which that's the question was was it was true, but even if it was true, is that sufficient? That's the fallacy. Is that what does that have to do with who he's been for the last 35 years and who he is today? Not much. So those are a couple examples of using that fallacy as if that's relevant today. And it may be. I mean, somebody may say, well, you know. We should have only people in the Supreme Court that have never made a mistake in their life, or that, I, I don't know. But, um, another one, is the Constitution racist and unfair and immoral because the people that wrote it were white males that owned slaves? No. The Constitution has given more freedoms to human beings in this earth than any other document in the history of humanity. Is it perfect? No. But... Is it horrible and evil because the people that wrote it were slave owners? No. To say that would be committing the genetic fallacy. See this? You know what this is? It's a wedding ring. What does it stand for? Commitment. Commitment. What else? Love. Love. Through sickness. Hatred. Eternal, eternal love. It goes forever and ever, right? Eternal so round of love. Something. You know what I've heard? You know what it stands for originally? Money. Women should never wear these. You know why? Because the original origin of these, it represents shackles. That women are held bondage and shackled to the man, and they're your property. That's a genetic fallacy. I don't give a rat's ass what somebody might have thought about this back then. What does it stand for today? Whatever you want it to stand for today. The Confederate flag is a good example of this. What it stood for for some people back 150 years ago may not be what it stands for today. Do we then throw out all of the flags because of, that's ridiculous. That's a genetic fallacy. These are all fallacies where you take the origin and the foundation of something and then assume that it's relevant today. And again, and I'll get to you in just a second, you guys were all going to be considered the most racist, evil, sexist, sons of bitches in the world to your great-grandkids. Because the morals of today are not going to be the morals of then. And they're going to be more enlightened. And they're going to look back at you and go, oh my gosh, you're horrible. And you're going to go, I, I thought I was enlightened. And I thought I was very forward thinking. And I thought I was very kind and generous. But apparently I was, well, yeah, you used to enslave dogs and cats and put them in chains and walk them around and put them in cages. You're a horrible person. 
really? I didn't think that was wrong. Well, that speaks volumes. Be very careful about this genetic fallacy. It's, it's, it's abused quite a bit, yeah. Is that like, so I gave uh, my coworker an ankle bracelet? Uh-huh. And um, she was saying that when she put it on, her husband was saying, take it off, because I guess it means like, that means that she's single. She's uh, the, from the Philippines. Oh, so in the Philippines, is that what that means? Like if they wear like ankle bracelets, I mean the woman is single. And he's Jeez. Like, and, and then he's saying that she can't wear it. But it's so cute, and I thought it was cute, so I bought it for her. I don't know, they're kind of something else. Yeah, in their, in their culture, maybe, I don't know, maybe that's what it means in their culture. Uh, any, any, anybody from the Philippines here? I don't know. Hmm? I'll ask. You'll ask? I'll ask. You know I'll let people, you know next class. You know people from the Philippines? Yeah. Yeah, my wife's Philippines. I mean, not actually from the Philippines, but her genetics are. <coughs> they're doing that a lot with a lot of things right now. Like, they're going back, and that's why I wish you would check out Will Kane like I asked you to. I know you didn't. <laughs> no, I didn't. But he asked a question the other day and got absolutely blasted for it because uh, there's a statue in front of, um, I want to, damn it, I should have looked, but anyways, a statue in front of the lady who wrote uh, God Bless America. Right, and, uh -huh. played, and I guess apparently back in the day she had, you know, uh, said s said some or some racist lyrics or something like that. So Will Kane asked a question about that. He asked about, you know, about the founding C -A -N -E fathers. C A N E or C A I N. C A I N. He asked a question about the founding fathers. You know, the ones that owned slaves that are on Mount Rushmore. He uh -huh. said, and, and I guess he caught a lot of flack for it because he says, if you start going down that, that hole, where does it end? Yeah, we got to be very careful. Our history, he caught a lot we of can't flack. undo our history. All we can do with our history is acknowledge it, accept it, and, 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 and move on from it. <clears throat> we can't purge our history. That's one of the things that scares me about like ISIS and those guys. They want to go in and destroy everything that they disagree with. No, we can't destroy things we disagree with. If there's, a, if there's a statue to, you know, Robert E. Lee somewhere, so be it. That's a statue to Robert E. Lee. So that's, we can't undo the fact that Robert E. Lee was a great leader of the Southern Army. Okay, so what? Does that mean we all hate whatever? I, and by the way, Robert E. Lee, from what I've read, was somebody who was not at all a racist son of a bitch. He was somebody who was a great leader and... And uh, had you know actually aligned himself much more with the Republicans than, than the Democrats back then, um, but you know just because of how things were separated, that's where he ended up. It would be like right now if we had California and Texas. Is everyone in Texas Republican and everyone in California Democrat? No, but if there was battle, that's where they'd fall, right? So it's you know it's interesting. Uh, anyway, uh, there was something else I was going to say on that. Um, I don't remember what it is. Okay. Next one. Oh, I do remember. Just so I was moving on. Last one, last example. Planned Parenthood. A lot of people don't like Planned Parenthood. Some people say Planned Parenthood is evil because the founder of Planned Parenthood, anybody know about her? You just nodded your head. Do you, what do you know? Do you know anything about her? Or, yeah. Uh, I've heard stuff, but I don't know. What have you heard? She killed babies. Yeah, that. She killed babies. Yeah. Why are you looking at me? No, that's what I heard, but she killed babies. Like she did it illegally. Don't look. Don't look. Don't listen without listening. <laughs> <Don't look. laughs> she was into eugenics, and she was, from what I've. Heard she was quite racist and she was into eugenics and she wanted to try to purge black people from the country and she saw abortion and uh, uh, the Planned Parenthood ideals to help with that. Is that a reason to not like Planned Parenthood today? No. No, it's not. If you don't like Planned Parenthood, don't like it for other reasons, but not because of the founder's beliefs uh, and, and goals and ideals. It has nothing to do with, with what it does today. Um, it's, you know, if you don't like it for a million different reasons, so be it, but not for that. That's a... So you don't believe that's never a reason to not like somebody because of their... Because of their well, 
what you can look, what you can do is remember we talked about credibility of claims, and one of the things we, we look at with credibility of claims is you look at the source and you say is the source biased for some reason. If there is a bias or potential bias, then is it reasonable for us to be suspicious to look further at the claim? And the answer is yes, right? If Philip Morris Tobacco Company had a study and the study says cigarette smoking is good for your health, oh, yeah, is, is it from a biased source? Yes. Is, this, is the study wrong? I don't know. I don't know. To say it's wrong right out of the chute and say it's wrong for sure, why? Because it comes from Philip Morris Tobacco Company, that's a genetic fallacy, you see? The source of the, of the claim is Philip Morris, therefore it must be wrong. No, it still could be right, but is it reasonable for you to be suspicious and to look further at the study a little closer than you might with another study that you don't have a reason to believe bias? Yes, we're critical thinkers, we're not idiots, right? And so as a critical thinker, you have to look at those things, the, the background, the history, for purpose of potential bias, but that's just so that you can look a little closer at the claim. But to dismiss a claim on outright because of the bias is the, is the fallacy. So thanks for following that up because that, that is an added little caveat to it. Questions about that? Questions about anything else? That flag, man, you, you struck a nerve with that flag. Mm -hmm. You struck a nerve with Honestly, that flag. Have, have you ever that been flag. to the South or lived in the South? I've been to the South. I've never lived in the South. I um, I've, uh, it, it's closest I've done, I've lived, in, I've lived in Maryland and I've lived in Kansas, both right on the edge of the South. But yeah, I've never lived in like, you know, Mississippi or Alabama or Tennessee or something like that. I got told that Mississippi, I got told in Mississippi straight up at a bus stop, um, not to make sure, because at the time my girlfriend was white, to at the time, I think, no, a gas station, that we should not go out at night to make sure. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, neither here nor there, but see, with that flag, it's just, it's the representation. You know what I'm saying? It's the connotation. Once you see that flag, to me, it just means it represents evil. That, that's that's the only thing I disagree with that you said. That's fine. So is is that that? Flag, but that but that's to, the but that's to you. I think it should to be everybody. It's everyone. not to me. It's not. To, I mean, most people when they see it don't don't have a a a reaction like that to it. Why not though? I, because because it. I guess. And, and you know, without without spending way too much time on this, I understand. it's it's. Well, that's the one thing you said. That no, I understand. Said. It's it's, be, it's because I, I don't see the world that way, and and the, the follow up question is why not? Mm -hmm. But I don't see the world in race, and and I know that I, and I, I've got some I've got some real good friends that are black, and and this is something that we kind of go back and forth on quite a bit when we talk about this, because I notice that they see the world in race more so than I do, um, and so. Uh, why is that? I don't know. I don't know if that's because if that's because they everywhere they go they see people seeing them a, as being black, or whether they were taught that growing up, or whether um, it, it's a reflection of, of our, you know, our experiences. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's a reflection of how they're treated. I mean, all all of those things. I, I, and the answer to that is I don't know because I'm not black. But you know, you know what's what's interesting is um, I was talking to uh, Mark. Uh, yeah, about this, and he's a young guy, um, probably medium complexion, complexion, black guy, big dude, um, and uh, we were talking about about the police, um, and he said, and he, we kind of had a little bit of a disagreement, and I'm not a big fan in general. Um, of police, uh, I mean I am, but very limited. Uh, I think in general they're, they're good guys, but a lot of hot heads that need to be reined in. But anyway, so we were talking about the police, and he said, Dale, you just, don't, you just don't get it. You don't know what it's like. You don't know what it's like to be a black man driving in a car and have the police pull up and turn their lights on and pull you over. You just, you, I, I, you don't know what it's like. And just a second. Mm -hmm. And, and, I, and I, I, I thought about it for a second, and I said, yeah, you're right, I don't. I don't. 
but you realize you saying that is racist. And he said, what? What do you mean? I said, you're presuming that since I'm white, I feel differently when I get pulled over. How do you know what I feel when I get pulled over? By you saying that, you're presupposing how I feel when you have no idea. And you're only thinking that I feel something differently because I'm white. So you're saying, because you're white, your experience in the world is different. And I know it's different because of the color of your skin. And I'm saying, I don't know. The answer is, I don't know. I've never been black and pulled over. All I've been is a white male pulled over. And you know what happens when I get pulled over? I'm driving along. I'm not paying any attention to anything. And all of a sudden, I glance at my rearview mirror, and I see there's a police officer behind me. And you know what I think? And you know what I feel? I don't think, ah, the good guys. <laughs> I bet you he's white. None of that goes to my head. You know what goes to my head? Oh, shit. And my heart goes, bum, 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 and I start beating, and I go, ah, crap. And I look at my speed, and I start, the anxiety, if I was hooked up to electrodes, it'd be like, Brrr! because I have anxiety, and I'm sweating, and I'm like, oh, crap. And all of a sudden, the lights go on, and I go, shit. I go, oh crap, and then I start thinking, you know, do I have anything out here? Do I have any guns or drugs or pills? No, I don't think that. But, I, but you know, but you know, whatever it may be, you know, and I start looking around, I go, dang, and I pull over. And then after I pull over, I'm sitting there and I wait and I go, okay, but where do I put my hands? Uh, do, I, do I leave them here? Do I do, I do what do I do? And I don't, uh, and so I roll the window down and I wait, and then they come over and then I say, hi, officer. And they say, driver's, re driver's license registration insurance. I say, okay, it's in the glove box and I get it. Yes, go ahead. And I reach over and this is what happened one time, this exact scenario. I get pulled over and I reach over and I, have I told you this story? Yeah. No. Knife? Oh, the knife? Yes. No, Your different one, not the knife. knife. And so I, way after this. So I, I reach over and I, I take out my driver's license and the registration, the insurance, and it's in my glove box, and I'm thumbing it through, and I get it, and my hands are a little shaky, and, and, I, and I take it, and I get my, I said, I'm gonna reach for my wallet, because it says my driver's license, it says okay, and I get my wallet, and I get my driver's license, and I get it to him, and I hand it to him, my hand's shaking. And he takes it, and he says, your hand's shaking? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he said, why, you nervous? Hell yeah. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm nervous. He said, why are you nervous? He said, because there's a man standing outside my window with a gun strapped to his hip. The lights from your cruiser are flashing in my rear view mirror in my eyes, and the other light is flashing on the side view mirror in my eyes. Your partner is standing over there with his hand on his hip looking in the window at me as you guys are asking me questions, and I have no idea why I'm being pulled over. That's why I'm a little bit nervous. And he said... And you can imagine me saying that, right? Mm -hmm. And I said all that. And then he said, and then he said, so have you ever been arrested before? <laughs> I said, why does that matter? Are you going to treat me differently if I have? <coughs> and he said, well, no. I said, then it doesn't matter. And he said, do you have any drugs or guns in the car? I said, no. He said, can I search the car? I said, absolutely not. No. He says, okay, okay. And he turns around, he walks to the back. 45 minutes later, oh my God. not, it seemed like 45 minutes, which sometimes you're on the other side of the road for 10, 15 minutes, and it seems like 45, right? And you're like, holy crap, what, 45 minutes? Oh, it's been 10, 15. No, 45 minutes was felt like an hour and a half to two hours, right? 45 minutes on the side of the road. I'm sitting there waiting. Go, what the hell's going on here? Finally, he comes over, and he says, the reason why I pulled you over is because you were driving aggressively. What does that mean? That's what I said. I said, what does that mean? He said, you changed lanes too often. I said, I, was I speeding? He said, no. Then? Aggressive driving? I haven't heard of this. Lane change too often? I, I, I said, oh, okay. He said, he said just, just take it easy when you're driving. Slow down a little bit. And I said, oh, okay. He says, so I'm just going to give you a warning here today. So what he did, in my estimation, because I used to work at the KBI, is I think he went back and ran national wants and warrants, which would take about 45 minutes. Every jurisdiction in the country to get back that, whether there's wants or not. He wanted to jack me. He was looking for somebody that wanted to be somewhere in this country. And inlets and NCIC didn't have anything on me, so there's not much he could do. And so he hands it back to me and he says, 
okay, have a good night. Oh, by the way, he asked, where do I work? I said, I work at the law firm down the way here. He said, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. You know, he asked all those stupid questions, and, and you know, and I answered them. And then he goes, gets in his car, and I'm like, son of a bitch. And so I put my stuff away, and I go to start my car. Click. Click. You know why? Dad, you're sitting there. I was sitting there with my lights on the whole time. Mm -hmm. 45 minutes with my lights on. And so I go, Ugh. and so he goes to pull out with his partner, and I put my hand out, and they, wait, 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 and they, ooh, they stopped. I said, I'm sorry, but this whole time we've been sitting here, my lights have been on, my battery's dead. I said, do you, I've got jumper cables, can you, can I jump my, my car, you know, with the, with the cables? You know what he said? No. He said, no. Nope. He said, I've, I've got the cables. He says, no, we don't do that. And I said, on the side of the, on the side it says protect, and I looked, and guess what it doesn't say on the side of the cars, uh, the police cars anymore? Protect and serve. It doesn't say protect and serve anymore. No, it doesn't say that anymore. What does it say? It says partnership with our community. Partnership, my ass. <laughs> so, I'm like, okay. I said, well, you've got those little black cushion bumper things on the front of your car. I said, can you, oh no, let me back up. So I, I, I said, you know, you're not going to jump? He said, no. He said, and you can't leave it here because this is a no parking zone. So <laughs> I'm going to call a tow truck and have it towed. I said, what? No. Uh, I said, I, I got to move it. He says, yeah, you got to move it. I said, well, how do I move it? I can't start it. I don't know. I said, well, can you, and then I said, can you, got, you got the little pushy things. Can you go back here and just push me into the parking lot right here next to me. You know what he said? No. No, no we don't do that. Well, why the fuck do you have those things in the front of your car? Right? Those are pushy things for the cars. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't do that. Okay. He said, tow truck's going to be here in a few minutes. Better move it. And he drove off. Wow. Three hours later. They really can't do that. Cars. No, they can. No, they can't. Well, sure they can. You're saying that their policy is they, that their they don't. Their policy is they can't do that with their with the go with the. No, they can. Car. Yeah, they can. They just their policy is they don't. Because I have a knee. My mom was we were. No, I know. I broke down and the cop pulled over and he said, "What's going on?" My mom was like, "My car died." And he's like, "She was like, can you help me?" And he's like, "I can give you my phone to call someone to help you." He's like, "I'm not doing that yeah. in the car. I can." Yeah. No, I know. They can. They, they can't. All they would have to do is change the policy. Do you know how much how much mileage you would get as police officers if, when you saw people broken down, you stopped and you helped? Think about that. Protect and serve. It used to be that way. When I was a kid, when you know we would see the cops behind us, you know what we would do? We'd go, "Yay, the cops are behind us!" Because it was fun. Cops were the good guys. I was a good guy. My family were good guys. The cops only went after the bad guys. You know what they go after now? Joe Sixpack, who's going back coming home from work, jacking him. Everybody gets jacked and everyone's treated like, like a criminal. And so when you say, do you know what it's like to be pulled over as a black man? No, but I know what it's like to be pulled over as a white guy. Is it different? I don't know. Maybe it's completely different. It may be ten times worse than I just described. It may be ten times better. I just don't know is the, is the answer. What are the For me to presuppose something different is presumptuous there's, of me. There's a, a show called Riding in Cars with, uh, comedians. with comedians. Yeah, Jerry Seinfeld and Chris. I watched. Rock, I watched Jerry it. Seinfeld and Chris Rock got pulled over together. Chris Rock was the passenger, and he was scared shitless, and Jerry was driving because he was a black man, and he said, "And I'm rich." Well, I I don't I don't know if that's I true or not. He was. He, he was the no, man. no, I don't. I I really don't think that's true. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't mean to be a dick, but he's Chris. He's Chris, he's Chris fucking Rock. It doesn't matter. He, I mean, there's listen. There's there's there are here. Here's the reality. Here's the reality. In my in my this is my opinion. There is a two tier system. It is not black and white. It is rich and poor. It is rich and poor. I guarantee when Barack Obama gets pulled over, it's different than I guarantee when Smollett gets off free, when O.J. Simpson, when you, if you're a rich black man, the world is different than when you're a poor black man. I'm telling you, it is. And when you're a poor white guy, it's different than when you're a rich, I mean, I see it, because I represent criminals. Poor people get jacked in this world no matter what color they are. Now, do black people get jacked more often? Maybe. Maybe they do. And if so, here, I've got a theory on this. You want to hear my theory or no? Yes. Sure. As to why I think black, because I do believe blacks are pulled over more often. Before yeah. you give me your theory, 
like when you were asking the police officer like why or what you know why would that make a difference like mm -hmm. you asking it it's different than if a black person is asking it because then the police uh, officer yeah, is going to take gonna it escalate as, way more yeah i don't know less. Yeah, and, yes. and maybe, maybe, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, I, I watch, I watch um, Active Self Protection. It's a, it's a YouTube channel. Anybody ever, anybody watch Active Self Protection? No. With the guy, he, he goes over every day he has a new, you should check it out. Every day he has a new video, and it's real live, real video of a lot of times officers, sometimes private, you know, security, that sort of stuff, but interactions with shootings or, in, you know, use of force, that sort of thing. And he analyzes it. And breaks it all down. And so I've seen hundreds and hundreds of these interactions. And, um, and what I've seen, in fact, the one this morning, I think it was this morning, either yesterday or this morning, was a black guy getting pulled over by an officer. He ends up getting shot, by the way, the black dude. But he gets pulled over. He's got warrants for his arrest. The guy doesn't know he's got warrants. And so he says, hey, uh, they got officer, the officer's asking him, you know, uh, can I get your driver's license registration? He goes, why? Why did I have to give you my driver's license registration? He says, well, because I pulled you over. You didn't have your seatbelt. He goes, my, that's ridiculous. It's a stupid thing. It is a stupid thing to be pulled over for. And he says, I got pulled over because I'm black, right? He goes, no, no. He goes, well, the white guy over there didn't have his seatbelt on. You need to pull him over. And he's like, well, you know, I can't pull over everybody. Just, sorry, I pulled you over. You didn't have your seatbelt. Driver's license registration. So he's, he's arguing with the cop. I mean, for... Five, ten minutes. No, I want it. I, I, I won't give it to you. Yeah, please give it to me. No, I want, I'm going to have to call my supervisor and have you taken in. I don't care. I'm not, and he just argues and argues and argues for ten minutes straight. And this guy was the whole time, sir, sir, please, sir. And so he says, finally, this other officer show up. And he goes to open the door. The guy jumps out, attacks the officer, gets, uh, picks the officer up, slams him on the ground, starts pummeling the officer. The other officer comes, thinks he's got his taser, and screams. He goes, taser, taser, and shoots him in the back with his gun. Taser's right here, gun's right here. Grabs the gun instead of the taser, shoots the dude right in the back. And, you know, he got, he got in trouble for, for firing a gun instead of a taser as he's screaming taser. But, um, so, I, I don't know. But I do believe that, that black people get pulled over more often. You know why? In my theory? Here's why. Because police officers are doing a job. And like anybody, they want to do their job well. And when it comes to being a police officer, they are under the impression that making arrests is doing your job well. I, I don't necessarily think that that's, that that's the case. But I think too many of them believe that. And finding bad guys is doing your job well. And so what they've concluded through years of being on the street and interacting with a lot of people that they pull over and they talk to is statistically speaking the odds of a person and you when you see a car go by with three white dudes in it a car go by with three black dudes in it what are the odds that the car going by with three black dudes are going to have warrants drugs guns or something versus the three white guys is it 50 50. Yes. and i think did you say yes? I said yes. Okay. I think the officers believe no. I think the officers believe that statistically speaking, it's, it's not 50-50. Even if it's 51-49, 70-30, whatever it is, the officers believe that it's not 50-50. And by the way, I would say they're probably correct on that for a different reason. Not because of the color of the skin of the, of, of the individuals, but because of the, the poverty level. The poverty level typically goes with, with race. Um, and what I've seen, especially in North Las Vegas, but and across the country in general, is that uh, black people are much more likely to have warrants because of these stupid people pulling them over all the time and charging them the same price for the same crimes that I'm charged with. So if I get busted for speeding, it's going to be 250 bucks. If I have a brake light out, it's going to be 250 bucks. You know what 250 bucks is for me? Nothing. What's 250 bucks for somebody who's on the lower economic scale? That's a paycheck. Do they pay their rent or do they pay the... And so what happens is they go down to the courthouse and they go, well, can I get on payment schedule? And they go, yeah, you get a payment schedule. It's $50 a month. And they start paying and they miss one month and all of a sudden they've got a warrant. 
I know this because I do this all the time. Clients come into me, they've got $3,000 in fees, and it started off with some stupid fucking tail light, and now here they are with warrant fees, and then they get reassessed in the back again, and they're three or $4,000, and I'm thinking, how are you ever going to get dig out of this hole? And they are poor, and they are forever slaves to the system. The, the, the police and the cities have now taken the place of the, of the plantations and enslaved the black man in America. And now everyone owes money to the government. And they're paying their monthly stipend so that they can stay out of jail. And I think it's, I think it's a crying freaking shame. And I, I think it's horrible. And we need to assess, really take a look at this. But so then the big question then is, why are blacks <coughs> more likely to be poor than whites? That's a bigger question. Because, because they're more likely to be poor, they're more likely to have warrants. Because they're more likely to have warrants, people, officers pull them over more. Statistically speaking, crimes are committed more by, by people who are desperate, and they are more desperate. And so you're going to have, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a bad situation, but that's the situation we're in in America. And it's not simply just tell the cops not to pull over black people. That's not going to fix the problem. It's a horribly deep problem that we're facing. Yeah. <coughs> Um, I don't know, I was going to say the environment of people that you surround yourself with. Sorry. I didn't hear you. The environment what? And the people you surround yourself with. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a big difference. Yeah, it really does. And, but, and you guys, uh, you got to realize, I do, I do a lot of criminal work, too. And so I, I deal with a lot of, a lot of people um, uh, of all different socioeconomic scales, from, from businessmen that are making millions and millions to people slinging it. You know, at the bottom of the of the scale, and people slinging cane on the corner. You know, I mean, I I, I represent everybody, so um, I see a lot, and uh, that's kind of how I how I see things going. It would be nice. It would be nice if officers did protect and serve like they used to. It would be nice to see an officer helping somebody change their tire. Wouldn't that be nice? Driving down the road and seeing that. Mm -hmm. see but I've been by. on the side of the road changing a tire and have an officer drive right by me, and I think really. Is, is the donut store really that important? Is it really important to pull someone over going 55 and a 45? Is that really going to help the, uh, our society? No, it's not. And the bad stuff, the really, really bad stuff, they show up too late. The woman's already got a claw hammer in her head by the time they show up. And they show up and draw the chalk outline and think that they've done their job. Fuck no. They gotta wait you need to show up. Yeah, you got to wait for something to happen. That's bull crap. Yeah, that, that, that bothers me. I, I, would, I would change things if I were in charge, but nobody's put me in charge. But you know? besides who you hang out with, it's also part of that, I think, is also color. Because um, my daughters are mixed black, and um, two different things have happened where I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, so my one of my daughters, it's she doesn't even look like she's mixed. She just looks completely black. And um, one time she had a car accident where somebody hit her from behind and uh, she was like 18, 19. So she calls me as to like, what do I do? So then mm -hmm. I went in over and they helped and then I said, well, you know, call the police, have it, do the police report or whatever. Um, the guy that showed up was a white policeman. Mm -hmm. The guy that hit her was a uh, Hispanic male with no papers. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy, the policeman that came over was writing her up as to her having have been the one at fault mm -hmm. for the accident. Uh, because, I don't know why, but anyways, after that. she was at fault. She, she was in front. The other, the car, the, the male, Hispanic male driver is the one that hit her on the back. Okay. Yeah, I, and I, I was there. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, sometimes, sometimes it can be that, that case if you do a swoop and stop. I mean, there are circumstances. I just don't know. I, and and then, you think it was because she was darker? Yeah, because I... And like, people, by the way, people who are Hispanic who say, who say, look, I'm targeted because I'm Hispanic. And for that, at that time when I was there, I'm like, what's going on? Because since my daughter, I, I'm like in the middle of both of them because... One is my daughter, and she's black, and the other one is a Hispanic male, which I, you know, uh, I, uh, I, as, 
not very simple, or I, I see like I have something going with that person too. It's, and then like now, years later, maybe about a year ago now, um, now she's a teacher, and they went on a she went on a trip to Washington D.C. with other uh, women that are also have um, uh, professionals, and still my uh, brother-in-law was talking about how terrible black people are and in his racism about black people. And she's like, do you realize you're talking about me with what you're saying? And he's like, no, you're not like that. It's all the other ones that I've met. And he's like, no. And I was telling him, no, you are do, you're exactly like what you're talking about, what they are, but you just a different color. Yeah. And, no, I, I know. And there's, here's, here, here's, what it, here's what it really comes down to is we mistake um, notions or claims, stereotypes with racism. Stereotypes are not racism, but we've equated it. <clears throat> we, we, we also have cultural issues, and we assume culture is racism. Racism is racism, you guys. That's different. These are skinheads. These are crazy you know, uh, black supremacists, these are, these are people who believe that simply because of the color of your skin, you are different biologically, inherently, and lower class or upper class or whatever it may be. There's a very few people out there that are like that. There are people like that, but very few. Most people we're talking about, we're talking about people who say black people tend to be, Asians tend to be, Hispanics tend to be, and those are typically cultural things, right? They're stereotypes and they're cultural. And, and blacks do it all the time to each other. You know, you have, well, you've got the ghetto black, and you've got the different, you've got the church black, and you've got the, you know, and that, you're talking culture, right? Somebody that grows up in, in when I used to live in D.C., you have, you have the hood, you have, you know, you have the projects. The project blacks were different than the non-project blacks because of how they were raised. But that's a cultural thing. That's, that has nothing to do with the color of their skin. It has to do with the fact that they were raised in a project their whole life. You take white people who raise them in projects their whole life, guess what? They also act the same way. They're project people. It just so happens that more blacks are project than whites or Hispanics, right? And so these are cultural differences that we overlap too much with being racist. And so I think legitimately we have concerns with, um, with uh, cultural differences, but, <coughs> but they are not the same as racism. And, and again, these, and they're, it's, it's a complex issue, it really is, but it's much easier to just break it down simply, yeah. I like this conversation, we've only got 30 minutes, and we have like a lot to go. Okay, yeah. next one. Hey. Straw man. Straw man is when you set up the other side's argument for them. Straw man is when you set up the other side's argument. And you set it up in a way that's very weak so you can knock it down. If you're going to kick somebody's butt, who do you want to fight? The weakest person there is. Who's the weakest person there is? Someone made of straw. So that's how you remember the straw man. You set up the other side's argument weak. So for example, let's say you're arguing about abortion. That's always the great one to talk about, right? Abortion. Abortion. So with abortion, let's say someone goes, well, I, I, know, I know you want to kill all children, but I don't. Wait a second, what? You see how that's setting up the other side's argument in a way that's very weak? Because if that's your argument, that you want to kill all children, then I'll, let, let's debate that all day long. Well, no, that's not, that's not my argument. So you set the other side's argument up in a very extreme, weak way so you can knock it down. Perfect example of this, by the way, is just the words, the name. Since we've talked about race. <laughs> and I won't go down that path again. The name of the group, Black Lives Matter. That is a straw man. You see how it's a straw man? No? Yes? Some people do. Some people are nodding. Some people are saying no. What does it imply? The that the other side is saying black lives don't matter, mm -hmm. right? So the claim black lives matter, well, okay, my question is who's saying that they don't, right? You're setting up the other side's argument of I know you don't think black lives matter, but they do. 
well, then the response will, well, well uh, are, uh, what? Who's, say, who's, who's arguing that, right? And so that would be, just that in and of itself is a straw man by setting up the other side's argument of, you think black lives matter, don't matter, but they do. That's a straw man. Real quick, let me tell you a story about, about this. <laughs> I was uh, getting pulled over. No, I'm kidding. I was, I was running a printing press, and I had my drink, my Dr. Pepper, that was empty, and so I wanted to get a refill. So I went down to the little 7-Eleven to get a refill, and I went over to get a <coughs> refill, 50 cents, wait in line, get to the front of the line, and the lady says, I've got... Uh, or she said, you know, 50, a dollar or 50 cents, please. I said, okay, I gave her a dollar. She takes my dollar, takes two coins, gives me my 50 cents back. I went to grab my money and I looked and I noticed that one of the quarters was a Canadian quarter. So I grabbed the American quarter and I slid back the Canadian one and I said, can I get a quarter for that, please? And she was already looking over my shoulder to the next customer. She said, uh, what? I'm sorry, what? I said, can I get a quarter for that, please? She said, that is a quarter. I said, no, that's a Canadian quarter. And she said, so? I said, so it's not, it's not a quarter here. It's a quarter in Canada. We're not in Canada. And she said, it's the same thing. I said, no, it's not the same thing. I said, I'm not going to go into the complexities of the Canadian-United States exchange rate of currency. But suffice it to say that that's not a quarter here, it's just a piece of metal here. Can I please have a quarter? And she said, so what you're saying is, since I'm Canadian, I'm not a human being? Yeah, and I said, I kind of was shocked. And I turned around, looked at the people waiting in line, and, Kind of petitioned them for some help, and they all shrugged their shoulders and said, good luck, dude, you know. <laughs> so I turned around back to her, and I said, yes, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying you're not a human being. <laughs> Can I please have a quarter? <laughs> I know. And so she took a quarter out, and she chucked it across the whole 7-Eleven. And I was like, oh, damn, that's funny. So I went back, got my quarter, and I, and I left and, you know, waved my quarter at her, and I left the 7-Eleven. <laughs> But that's a straw man. So what you're saying is that I'm Canadian, so I'm not a human being. No, that's not at all what I was saying. But you see how she set my argument up for me. That's mm -hmm. a straw man. Remember the story I told you about the guy at the law library? Remember when I was in line at the law library? No. No. Never class. Oh. <laughs> I do hate you guys so much. No. So I was, I was at the law library, and I had to go check out a book. Just real, we'll make this real quick. <laughs> I was in the law library, and I had to check out a book. And um, I found the book I needed. It was actually a, a CLE, Continuing Legal, Legal Education course. And so I, I found it, and I was <clears throat> standing in line, and I'm the type of person who likes to talk to everybody, you know. And so I'm <clears throat> standing in line waiting and waiting, and I'm looking around for someone to talk to. And some guy stand, gets back behind me in line. <clears throat> And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> and I and I turn around and I, I look at him and you know yeah you do you just kind of size everyone up. So I kind of looked and sized him up and wearing a suit, well manicured, looks like an attorney. I thought oh look it's an attorney, and he has in his hand a book that was a policy procedure manual for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. As an attorney, I know the only way you can sue the police is violation of ministerial acts. You can't sue them for discretionary acts. It has to be ministerial acts. How do you find out what the ministerial acts? You have to get the policy procedure manual so you know what to sue them on. I've sued them before. I know these things. And so I, I, all that went through my head. I turned around and I said, this guy's an attorney. He's dressed like an attorney. He looks like an attorney. He's got a policy procedure manual. He's clearly got a case against the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department, right? We're in a law library. I did the math. I figured I'm going to talk to him about the case he's got. With the, we can, you know, sh share war stories. So I said, "Oh, you got a case against the Metropolitan Police Department?" And he looks at me and he goes, "Why? Because I'm black." <laughs> <laughs> and I went, "What?" I mean, it just it just totally caught me off guard. 
And I go, um, and it took me a second to understand what he was meaning. And I go, no, no. And he's in, he just lays into me. You racist son of a, and he just goes off on me. And I go, I, I'm sorry. I said, I'm so sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to offend you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he just kept going and kept going and screaming at me. And I said, you know what? I'm sorry. And I turned around and I just, and he just kept going and going. And finally I got to the front. I checked my book out. And he's mumbling under his breath. And I, and I left. That is an example of straw man, right? He's setting up my position for me. Here's the worst part about that story, in my estimation is that right now, he's possibly telling somebody else the story. And you know what his version is? A crazy white guy with a beard. His <laughs> version is a crazy, racist, white dude thought that I was suing the police department because I'm black. That's his version of it, right? What he didn't understand it was the complete opposite. I didn't give a rats. I didn't. I thought he was an attorney. In fact, I thought just the opposite of what he thinks I thought, which is I thought he was an attorney who represented a client who. And so the irony of that, to me, in or the sad part about that is that that's harming race relations in America when it should be a situation that reflects the fact that I didn't see it that way at all, right? And it reminds me of when Michelle Obama gave a story one time about a similar thing. Someone asked her, and she was in a, in a group, and she was uh, asked about what, whether she thinks there's racism in America. And you know what she said? She gave an example. Remember what she said? She said, yeah, I think there is still some. And she gave a story about when she was in a grocery store. She said, I was in a grocery store, and this little old white woman looks at me and says, can you reach that for me and, and, and hand that to me? And she said, how dare her think that just because I'm black that I could that I serve her and that I would get something for her. And I'm thinking to myself, or it could be that you're six feet tall <laughs> and you might be able to reach what she couldn't reach. I, I don't know. Maybe she was racist as hell. I don't know. Or but it's interesting, you know, the way she set the other side's argument up for her is, and that's a, these are all examples of you set the other side up because it's easier to knock down the other side's argument. All right, next one. Let's talk about false dilemma. <clears throat> false dilemma is when you set up a situation where you give somebody two options only. You limit somebody's considerations or give somebody only two options when there are several options that are possible. False dilemma is when you set up a situation so that people have to choose between two options when there's multiple options to choose from. And typically what you do is you set it up in a way where one of them really sucks mm -hmm. and the other one is your position. Parents do this to kids all the time. Yes? Politicians usually do that too. Politicians love to do this. They'll say something like, well, you know, you could allow people to run around shooting people and having children get shot accidentally all the time, or you could pass reasonable gun legislation. You could either let these criminals out to rape and murder over and over again, or we could start using the death penalty. What? I mean, there's a million other options we could do here, right? No, those are the only ones. Do you want raping and murdering or death penalty? Those are your options. You choose. Well, I guess if I have to choose between that, I'm going to choose the death penalty versus raping and pillaging uh, I, but are there other options? No. So that's the idea. Is you, you falsely set it up in a way that has a false dilemma between two options when one is the one you want and the other one is a horrible one. False dilemma. Next one. Perfectionist. The perfectionist fallacy says that <clears throat> a position, a claim should not be pursued or followed unless it's perfect in every way. Unless the outcome is unflawed. A position or a claim shouldn't be followed unless the outcome is perfect. Should not be followed unless? Yeah. So for example, let's say President Obama wants to pass <coughs> um, 
the uh, Affordable Care Act, Obamacare. And the Republicans say, well, it's not going to solve all of America's health care problems, so therefore don't vote for it. What? No. No, no, no. No bill will solve all of the problems. The question is, does it solve the ones you want to solve? If so, vote for it. But no bill is going to be perfect to solve everything. Another example would be sex education. Should we teach kids sex education in school? Well, unless we can eliminate child or a teen pregnancy to zero, then we shouldn't teach it at all. What? No. It doesn't have to be perfect. If it helps out even a little bit, I would think it would be worth it, right? No. No, it has to be perfect. Should we do sex offender treatment programs in prison? Well, good question. Can we cure all sex offenders? No. Then we shouldn't do it at all. What? Wait, no. Can't. What if we even say help one? Wouldn't that be worth it? Right? And so that's the idea. If, unless it's perfect, we shouldn't do it at all. Perfectionism. Could you repeat the definition of it? Perfectionism? Yeah. Is that you shouldn't um, uh, adopt, accept a claim unless it's, uh, the outcome is perfect. I don't know. I mean, it's something like that. Uh, what does the book say? Principle, uh, simply because it is um, downgrades policy X simply because it's not perfect. It's a version of false dilemma. It is a version of false dilemma. The book doesn't even give us a definition. Was it a person or claim should not be followed if it's not perfect in every way? There you go. That's what I said. Thank you. Next one. Line drawing. <coughs> Line drawing is very similar to perfectionism. It's also a type of a false dilemma. Line drawing says that unless you can definitively tell me at what point your claim is defined, then you can't have the then you can't have the position. You can't have the claim. If you can't define the claim at a specific point, then it's an invalid claim. And this, if you notice, parallels with vagueness, right? With vagueness. It forces you to draw a line to define a claim when you don't have to. That's another definition. It forces you to draw a line to define a claim when you don't have to. Line drawing forces you to draw a line to define a claim when you shouldn't have to. That's line drawing fallacy. So, like I said, it's, it's just it's the same thing as vagueness. It uses vagueness as, as the fallacy. Where, let's say, you want to raise taxes on the rich. Right? I think the rich should pay more. Okay, well then, who's rich? Unless you can tell me at what point you define rich, then we shouldn't raise taxes on the rich. See how that's line drawing? Forcing you to say, at this point, unless you can prove to me that rich people start at 500000 and one penny, then you can't raise tax on the rich. No, you can still believe the principle is regressive taxes are bad and progressive taxes are good without forcing you to draw that line. Is reckless driving something we should... Stop? Yeah. Well, unless you can define that and tell me exactly at what point your driving is reckless, then you shouldn't have the law. No, I think I know it when I see it. That's, that's line drawing. Driving too fast. What's too fast? Well, the, actually the law allows you to ticket somebody for going under the speed limit if it's too fast. Did you know that? Yes. It's yeah, called, it's called impeding. You can too fast for the conditions. If it's if it's heavy fog and rain and that sort of thing, and you're going 55 and a 55, officer can pull you over and go, "You're going way too fast for the conditions." Well, what's too fast? Yeah, exactly. What's too fast? Is is 40 too fast? And if you said to the officer, "I'm going 55," well, what's too fast? Is 40 too fast? Well, I, I, I don't 41. 
42, at what point did it become too fast? Shut up, take your ticket, right? That's the fallacy. Unless he can tell you at what speed, no, 55 was too fast, that's all I know. I know that you were going too fast and I don't have to tell you at what point it became that. That's a fallacy. Got it? Okay. Got it good. Next one. Slippery slope. Slippery slope is the notion that, the fallacy that once you go one step down the path, that the end of the path is inevitable. One step down the path, the end of the path is inevitable. Yes? So it would be like, if someone says, if you smoke marijuana, you're going to become a crackhead? That's exactly it. Yeah. If you, if, you start, if you smoke marijuana once, then before you know it, you're going to be turning tricks on the corner for dime bags of, of crack. And here's why this fallacy is so powerful. It's because so often that is the case. Quite often that is the case on the, on the, on the slippery slope. Often enough that people are scared. Because you know what? Every single person doing tricks for dime bags on the corner started off drinking alcohol. Every single one. But does that mean every single person that drinks alcohol is going to end up on the corner doing No. No, no, no. But it happens enough that it's a little scary. I remember my mom making that argument to me. You know, if you never drink, you'll never become a, a, an alcoholic. I'm like, that's, that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> And I never drank because of that. Yeah. I honestly feel like alcohol is more of a gateway drug than marijuana. Well, yeah, that's why, that, and that's it's interesting because I went back to alcohol. Alcohol is by far the gateway drug. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, then you alcohol. Well, I, you know, again, most people, most people drink, and most people drink responsibly, but it is the the gateway drug <clears throat> because you drink alcohol strictly for the purpose of the, of of you know its effect. You don't drink it for the taste. I mean, not at first. You might eventually like start liking shitty tasting alcohol. But at first, everyone goes, oh, 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 what the hell was that? Just keep trying it. You'll eventually go, <laughs> you'll get over that eventually. Okay, if I do it enough, maybe I'll start liking it. Yeah, if it's really, really cold so you can't taste it, then it's better. Okay, yeah, and eventually, yeah, uh, but... Yeah, it is true. Yeah, I mean, nobody, nobody likes alcohol unless it's so diluted that, you know, you can't taste it. But if you taste it, it's horrible at first. So why do you do it? You do it for the effect. And so you, you drink to get, to get, you know, drunk, or at least to get buzzed, or to get whatever it is. And that, once you start doing that, then what's the next step? What else do you do to get buzzed? And then that's the gateway. Most people don't do that, but those who do, tie it to that. So let me give you an example, though, another one. Is the, it, it's, it, it's the fallacy that once you step on a path, the end of the path is inevitable. Once you start going down the path, once you drop out of high school, you're inevitably going to be homeless. Well, no. No. Or once, whatever it is, whatever the path is, whatever path you're going down. Give you an example of this one. Back in 1978, the homosexual community wanted to eliminate the, um, the idea that uh, homosexuality was a psychosis, that it was a mental, you know, psychosis. And so uh, <coughs> there was a big push to have that taken out of the psych, what is it called? The, uh, what's the book? Anyway, a psychological disorder, a psychosis. The AMLA or ALM or what, you guys know what the thing is called? The, the psych, the psych, oh, no. DMS or? I know what you're talking about. What is it? DMS? DMS? Um, and so they wanted to take it out of that and so that it's not considered a you know, psychological disorder and um, as a deviant sexual behavior. And so there was a big argument back and forth. I remember when this was going on, and the argument on the other side of doing that, of removing it, said, look, if you remove that, then the next thing you know, you're going to have homosexuals who want to be married. You're going to have people who are transgenders, and lesbians and pedophiles and all these people wanting to be that removed from from the as a psychosis as well and you know what the response was that'll never happen that'll never ever happen no way 
Well, guess where we are right now? I'll tell you where we are right now. At first it was the gays wanted to have it removed. Right? Then the lesbians said, how dare you be sexist, you son of a bitch. We also want it removed. We said, okay, we're not going to be sexist, lesbians and gays. Okay. And then what happened? Bisexual. The bisexual said, how dare you? What if I'm not lesbian or gay, but I'm both? And you say, okay, fine, fine. You're in there too. You're in there too. And then the trans community said, us too. And we said, fine, yes, yes. And then what happened? Q. And what does Q stand for? Question. Questioning or Q, queer. Depends, you know, some people do different things. Before we go much further, just a second, let me back up. When this happened back in 1978, the straight community said what? They said, no, 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 you gay people are not legitimate sexual people because why? Because straight people are... We're born straight. That was the argument. And so what did the gay community say? You don't remember. Anybody old enough to remember this? Yes. The gay community said, born that way. In fact, there's songs about it, right? Born that way. I'm, well, I'm born that way. I, too, am born that way. And I remember when that was happening. By the way, I wrote a paper on this. I wrote a paper on this back in 1992 or 94 or something like that. And I made the same argument. And I said, no, no, no. Please, you people in the gay community, don't do this. You will regret making this argument that you're born that way. And you know why? Because of the slippery slope fallacy. And I'll explain it in just a second. So number one, born that way, right? Next thing. is, I'm looking at the time, just a second, before I get back, before I get back to this, let me, get, let me finish the slippery slope, LGBTQ what, A, P, what does A stand for, asexual, what does P stand for, pansexual, what else is there, I, bi, or I, which is what, Intersexual? What else? Oh, there's more. Yeah, I mean, I won't go through it now, but Google it. Google, you know, go to, to Wikipedia and you'll see that there's like 20, you know, and it just keeps going on and on. The, and then you have things like bestiality, and you have things like necrophiliacs. The feet fetish people. The feet fetish pe people, which is feet fetish people. <laughs> you can make money off pictures. What? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> So, so, just a second. The argument, the argument at the beginning was, if you start going down this road, we're going to end up with these guys. No, I'm sorry. These guys, because those are pansexuals right here. So P2, what is this one? Pedophilia. The argument is that pedophiles are going to say, I'm born that way too. They have. And they have. Yeah. They've been saying that for a long time. When I was in law school, we had a whole chapter in our con law book on NAMBLA. You guys know what NAMBLA is? No. Yes? yes? Oh, the community that's like... North American Man-Boy Love Association. In fact, South Park had an episode about it. North American Man-Boy Love Association. They've been around for a long, long time, and they've been going to the Supreme Court over and over again saying, how dare you, we're born this way. As soon as you adopt this, I'm born this way, where does it stop? Slippery slope. The slippery slope and the line drawing fallacy, right? So here's, here's the concern. My concern is that the pedophiles have won. NAMBLA's won. It's over. What do you mean? It's already over. NAMBLA won. Won what? The argument. So what does that mean? It means that pedophilia is going to be legalized. No, in the U.S.? Oh, sure. I'll kill somebody. Why? 
I'll be in a thousand. That's disgusting. You know what they said back in 1978 about homosexuals? They it's said not that's the disgusting. Just say, like, just say. You know what they said about transgender people? They said that's people. disgusting. Listen, the, the thing is, is that lesbian or gay, you know, we're around the same age. If they're lesbian or gay, they'll be attracted, you know, to the same age. When you're taking something that's the innocence of a child, that's like completely different. No, it's not. There are children they don't understand. Oh, they do. That's disgusting to see. What? Older just a second. No, no, no. Seriously, what's a child? Someone who can't take. It. No, wait, hold on. <laughs> Someone who is here's just age. a second because we don't have a lot of time. Let me explain why why we've lost it. Number number two we have here is abortion law. What do abortion laws say? Now we're gonna go into when is a, when is it a fetus? So no, 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 not that. What does abortion law say? What's an abortion about? What is all the women marching? It's my my body. I do what I want with my body. It's my body. I can do what I want with my body, right? What does abortion law also say? That children can have abortions. Can children have abortions? Yeah. Yeah, they can choose. 13, you get pregnant, you can have abortion. You have to have your parents' permission? Yeah. Depending on the state. Depending on the state, depending on the circumstances, no. You're a body, you can do what you want. Not only that, but can you have sex at 13? If you want to. Yeah. If you're a body, you can do what you want. If your boyfriend's 13, can you do that? Sure. Is it illegal? No. The law allows children to choose to have sex if they want. Already. Do you guys understand that? The law already says children under the law can choose to have sex if they want. So my question to you is, do you think the age of the penis matters? And if so, I'm, I don't mean to be crude, but it, that's the question. Does it matter? Yes. It's interesting, right? Yes. I think it does. It's this, whole, this whole notion scares the hell out of me. But I'm telling you, it's over. You know why? Because the last thing on here is what? What just happened recently? I don't know. See what you're packing up your... I'm out here. I don't want to hear more about this. No, I don't like it. That's fine. The gay marriage law passed. What did gay marriage stand for? What's the, what's the ruling? Love wins. It's about love. Love wins. It's not about anything else. It's about love. When you, once we as America say it's about love, can children love? Sure. It's about who you love. Love wins. If, if we say it's about love, you can do what you want with your body, and you're born that way, tell me how pedophiles haven't won already. Not only that, the last linchpin is under the criminal law. Guess how old? Criminal law allows you to be charged with a crime that you have sufficient mental mens rea to know right and wrong and to choose. Five. Twelve. Four. Four. Eight. Eight. Eight years old. Eight. Sufficient mental mens rea to choose right and wrong. I heard a TED talk about a month ago, a woman, and her point was, we should start asking children when we change their diaper, two, three, month, four month year old children, when, they, when you change your diaper, you should ask the child for permission before you do that. I heard that one. Did you hear that? That scares the hell out of me. You know why? That scares the hell out of me because you're implying that a child can give consent to what happens to their body at that age. No. No, 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 no. That scares me. I do not want to be in a world where we have legitimized and legalized pedophilia. But that's what's happening based on the laws. Why is 18 the age of adulthood? Because we lowered it to 18 from 21. That's why. And you know what the Democrats want to do right now? They want to lower it to 16. Well, okay. So simply, all it is is just a matter of convincing us that it's not disgusting. Once we believe it's not disgusting, 
then we just say, it's not disgusting. Here's what it'll be. It'll be children's rights. Are you pro-children's rights or against children's rights? So you're anti-children's rights? Is that what you're against? You don't think children should have a choice? You don't think children can love? How dare you, you, you childrenist? <laughs> this scares me. I see this coming down the road, and I cherish children, and I do not want to see this happen. But I think it's over. And it scares the hell out of me. And I think the gay community, I think the gay community is going to be the one that is going to go, whoa, 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 what happened? Because you know what's going to happen? Here's what's going to happen. The one argument that everyone has had about gays since the 70s and on and on, they're disgusting perverts. Why? Because they're nothing but a bunch of pedophiles. That's what everyone has always accused them of, right? They're always self-conscious about, you don't remember this. Back, that was a big argument. Gays are nothing but a bunch of pedophiles. And they fought and fought and fought to say, no, we're not a bunch of pedophiles. These are adults agreeing, we love each other, leave us alone. And then you know what everyone's going to say? As soon as NAMBLA comes up and makes this argument, everyone's going to say, I told you so. And what is it, NAMBLA? NAMBLA. So what was this approved? Like, like what year was this approved? What, what, what is this? What do you mean? Like, was this legal? Is like in the U.S. or certain states? What is this? What do you mean? The pedophiles? Of pedophiles being... No, I'm not saying it's passed yet. I'm saying it's... It, in my estimation, this is all in place already. Oh, okay. All they have to do... All they have to do is file a Supreme Court brief and say, you can't, you can't make... The, this law is unconstitutional. Yeah, no. How is that law... Why not? Tell me why. Because they're disgusting. Because they're disgusting, okay. And that's what everyone said about gays. Just all that. So then, if that, I, I hope you're wrong. Because that's easily changed. No, I, I'm serious. What people think is disgusting is easily changed. Pornography was so disgusting, everybody now thinks it's no big deal. Gays were disgusting, no big deal. Transgender was disgusting, no big deal. If it's only because it's disgusting, then that scares me because all we have to do is change it. People just don't think it's disgusting anymore. That scares the hell out of me, because in a lot of countries around the world, that's the case. Pedophilia is normal. That's right. And so I hope it's not that. I hope it's something more than that. Yeah. Well, I was going to say I'm glad that you're not pro that, because you have a very tight argument. Yeah. For example. Yeah. I mean, how do, you, how do you refute this? We've got tons of Supreme Court case law that says, show me how. All we, uh, it's just simply age. It's just a line drawing. So between 8 and 18, where do you want to draw the line? 17. 17? Is that it? Okay. So you're going to have states that go 8 years old, 10 years old. You can have, you can have sex. You can get married. You can, you can choose to have your man-boy love association. You can have a 40-year-old boyfriend at, at 11 if you want. Right now, there's some states that you can marry off your children. That's right. Yeah, there's states you can marry at 14. It doesn't matter if he's 80 years old or 60 years old. Or 50. It doesn't matter. I mean, you see how this, this is why this is scary. We are already making the arguments to put this in place, you guys. And by the way, and here's, here's the follow-up, and there, this is the linchpin. You know, my, you know what my paper said? My paper said, this was 20, 30 years ago, whatever it was. I argued sexuality is not born. That's, in my estimation, the big lie from both sides. The straight community is wrong. The gay community is wrong. You're not born that way. As soon as you, as soon as you start arguing, we're born that way, now you're into the line drawing, slippery slope, because all you have to say is, I'm born that way. And then who are we to judge? Just a second. The reality is, everybody here probably would is an adult, and you have sexual thoughts and feelings and emotions. Here's the reality, is sexuality is not simple. It's complex. It's extremely complex. And I bet you every single person here, in certain times in their life, have thought in your head, oh my gosh, that's the creepiest thing I've ever thought. I can't believe I thought that. I'm a virgin. I can't believe even virgins think these things. 
I'm sure you've thought crazy things. You've entertained in your mind crazy things. You've thought whatever it may be, and you've gone, oh, I, oh my gosh, I can't believe I even thought that. Sexuality is very complex. It's not simple. Not a single person in the world said from the very beginning, this is it, and I've never, every single gay person I've ever known in my life, and I've had a lot of gay friends, 100% of them have been with somebody of the opposite sex. 100% of them. And so at some point, their body worked for that. So when you have somebody who's been married with children for 40 years and then says, now I'm gay, and we all go, oh, well, he's always been gay. Really? Then how the hell has he been banging his wife for the last 40 years? If he's only gay and sexuality is simple. And, no, it's not simple, you guys. It's complex, and it has to do with a lot of many, 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 many factors out there, and it's not that simple. And when you understand that, when you appreciate that, then you go, you know what? We can be honest about this, and we can address this, and we can say, this is something, instead of we're born that way, we say, you know what, let's address this as adults. I think Nambla is the line, though. Thank you. Be the line. I hope so. I hope so. We're going further and further. Yes, ma'am. I read there's actually something wrong with their brains. They're doing scans or something like that. And I read, I remember I read it, that there's something wrong with their brains. So Who's there? Pedophiles, that, that they have something wrong with yeah, like, but, their brains. Yeah, but you see, I've lived long enough to hear that same argument right here. No, but like research, I'm pretty sure. No, same research. Gays don't and lesbians yes. don't have nothing. It's always I'm been the sure argument. The That's always been the oh, argument. I'm just telling you, that was the argument. The gays have something wrong in their brain. But was it facts? Unless it's facts. And facts change. Yeah, no, I understand. Pedophiles, they really got something. So then the courts could be like, you guys are effed up in the head, so no, you guys can't do this. Yeah. I hope you're right. I'm going to be on a march like this. Yes. Can we run through the last three real quick? Or you got to go? No, let's go. What are we on? Just a second. Slippery slope. Learn to prove. Let's, we'll, do, we'll do the rest of it. We'll do the rest of it next time. I'm, I'm not going to test you on it. We didn't get the bottom two. Yeah, those are the only three. All right. Can the Supreme Court just not hear it? Yeah, they can choose to not hear it. But what's going to happen is it's going to go up to other, go up to other jurisdictions. Like in the other. So in like the Ninth Circuit, the Tenth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit, they're going to hear those cases because they can't choose not. They don't have certiorari. So uh, certiorari means the right to reject a case. So uh, they are going to have to decide. So you may have a situation where the Ninth Circuit has a ruling different than the Tenth Circuit, different than the Fifth Circuit, different than the Second Circuit, and so you have all these conflicting. This is the way it was with gay marriage. With gay marriage, you had different jurisdictions having different decisions. And so what, ha what happens if you have, let's say, California, who says that age of consent for, for getting married and having sex is 10? So then what happens? Well, anybody who wants to have your 10-year-old boyfriend, you just move to California, and you live there. And then people go, well, wait a second. And so the Supreme Court's going to have to hear it eventually. Because what happens if you go to California and you get married in California to your 8-year-old, you're 45, and your, 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 your child bride is 8, and you get married? Well, guess what? When you move to Arizona, is that a legal, is that a legal marriage? Yes, because we have a thing in the United States where it, all marriages in any state that it's valid is recognized in the other state. That's what happened with gay marriage. Everyone just went to Vermont or whatever, and they got married, and they were valid in whatever state they were in. So what happens if one state passes it? It's going to have to be addressed. That's crazy. It's shocking, isn't it? But, I, I mean, I tell you, it's only, it's only shocking because it's new. To me, when I, when I heard this argument back then, I've seen what's happened. And so, to me, I go... And this isn't shocking to me. This is just, we just need to be very mindful. And we need, my, my point is we need to change how we see the argument. Because the way the argument is done right now, it's over. I mean, who are you to say that necrophiliacs aren't a legitimate, they're born that way. I'm, I'm born wanting to have sex with dead people. It doesn't hurt anybody, they're dead. <laughs> I remember when I worked at the Attorney General's office, we were prosecuting a guy. And he was screwing chickens. And he said, I just love the feel of the wings on my thighs. I've always loved that. Well, how, are you to, how are you to say he wasn't born that way? 
So is, is he hurting any humans? No, maybe property. Here, pay some money. It's just property damage. They're just chickens. So how would you argue the other way? Well, like, the, how would you have done it? Well, like, I, I would have, I would have said uh, this. The first thing is uh, that that's the big mistake, in my opinion. Because as soon as you buy into the born that way, then it, it, what you're saying is if God or nature made you this way, then you can't challenge it. Then, then there's some presupposition or pre-belief that, it's, that you, we can't question it. That it's valid because it's by nature or by God. And, I, and, and once you get over that, then you say, no, this is, sexuality is, is it, it, it's basically environment, it's biology, it's hormones, it's experiences. Um, it's, it's a complicated you know, notion of all of those things. Because you have some societies where homosexuality is much more prevalent than other societies. Well, is that because there are more people born that way? Well, no, that's explained, well, they're just hidden in the closet. I, I, don't, I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think that society has a tremendous influence on these things. And so... So sexuality is, to some degree, fluid. People that are straight as straight as straight go into prison, and guess what they become? Gay as gay as gay. And then they come back out of prison, and guess what? They're straight again. Well, sexuality isn't that simple, right? I thought you were born that way, and you're straight only. Well, how can you have sex with men in prison? Very easily. Watch. I used to work in prisons. I watched it happen. These guys were normally straight, but they're gay in prison. It just kind of shows me that your body, I believe we are born to copulate. That how that is directed is a different story. One of the, one of the there's a study back in the 50s that showed that um, most people end up, their sexuality ends up being, um, for most people, whatever their first experience was. Which I thought was interesting. It's kind of that, that's the foundation. That's what you're, you're familiar with and comfortable with. And so, and even if it's molestation. So, if you're molested by a man, and you're a man when you're, you're, you're a boy, then you're much more likely to be gay in your life than if you were molested by a woman or your first experience was with, was with a woman. Which is interesting, you know. And so, does that mean that you're more inclined to be born that way? Does that mean that you were targeted because you were gay? Does that mean, I mean, it, it's an interesting, interesting question on that, right? Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't know, but it seems to be that there is some influence of experience in your mind lays kind of a basic foundation for that. I don't know. That's good. <laughs> Isn't it? So, yeah. And can we change? Well, there's, 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 when I was working at the AG's office and I, re and I represented sex offenders, I read a whole bunch of studies on, on uh, sex offender treatment. And one of the studies I read um, talks about masturbatory training. And it says that they take, they, what they were doing is they were taking pedophiles and they would say, can we take a pedophile and make them not a pedophile? And so what they were doing is they would say, okay, they would hook them up to electrodes and check their blood flow in their genitals to see what turned them on. And they would show them pictures and videos of these little girls on swings or whatever, and they'd, they'd see the blood flow, and they'd go, okay, this is turning them on. And they'd say, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to have them masturbate to age-appropriate people, you know, females. So let's say that eight years old is the key. of the, That's the perfect age for them, let's say. So they would have them start masturbating to like 12-year-old, and then 14, and then 18, and then 20, and then 30, and they say, okay, as time goes on, what happens is it, it starts to <coughs> mentally and emotionally, when they hook them up to electrodes, they're not as turned on with the younger ones as they are with the age-appropriate ones, and so they can actually steer the behavior that direction. Fascinating studies on this behavior. If sexuality is born, then you wouldn't be able to do that. The mass murderer, last thing, mass murderer, um, uh, the guy that was executed in Florida, um, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy, when his last, one of his last interviews, he said, people ask, you know, what, what the hell? He was, he was horrible. He would, he would take young women, uh, college-age women, and he, would, um, he was a necrophiliac. So he would torture them, kill them, and then have sex with their dead body. Um, and, uh, and so they said, how did you get to this point? He said, I was normal like anybody else. He said, I just started looking at Playboys, 
and then it didn't turn me on as much anymore. And so then I started to have it a little rougher, and I started trying to look for porn that was a little more aggressive than you know, bondage and BDSM, sadomasochism. And then that led into kind of like fake rape scenes. And then that led into fake snuff films. And then that, you know, it's just, it's slowly progressed. And I needed more and more and more to turn me on. And pretty soon I had to see death and, and torture and rape for it to turn me on. And then I had to live it out. So was he born that way or did it progress and he allowed it to get out of control? You know, was it like a little flame that burned a house down eventually and he didn't keep the flame contained? I, I don't know. It's an interesting, I mean, again, all, all I come back to over and over again is sexuality is not simple. And when we try to do this whole, reduce it down to a letter and a name, I think we're doing ourselves a big disservice to sexuality. It's not that. You're not gay. You're not bi. You're not trans. You're not, no, it's, it's, it's much, much more complicated than that. And when we're honest about it, then I think we can better address what we do about it. And when we're honest about what a child is, and that that's kind of a gray area too. I mean, you go to prison for having some, have sex with somebody who's 17 and 11 months, but the next month she's perfectly legal? Really? That's absurd. But that's a line drawing fallacy, right? You gotta draw the line somewhere, okay, but, you know, how many times have you, I don't know, are you attracted to women? Yeah. Okay, how many times, I, presupposition, right? How many times have you been walking around somewhere and you look and you see somebody and you go, oh, wow, and you find out she's 13 or 14 or an inappropriate age, but she looks 18. appropriate for you to be attracted to, right? Yeah. It's hell. I mean, it, all the time that happens. All the time that happens. And people are like, oh, you, you pig, you're disgusting. You, I don't know. My eyeballs and my body said... That's appropriate. That's post-pubescent. When you have curves, when you are post-pubescent, as a man, I'm attracted to post-pubescent women. I don't know your age. I didn't card you. I mean, you know, so it's, it's tough. And when we're honest about sexuality, then I think we can be a little more, you know, it's really post-pubescent and pre-pubescent that we're talking about. And, and you know, then, then it gets gray. How do you draw that line? How do you make laws? It's tough. It really is. We want simple answers, and they're not. What were you going to say? Oh, that's two things. One, so you're saying the LGBT thing is more of a fallacy? No, what I'm saying is the idea, what I was saying in class, is the idea that once you give gays rights, that you're going to have to give everybody rights and accept everything as born that way okay. is a fallacy. You can draw a line here somewhere. And some people would say the line that you draw is at, is at age of consent, a, you know, adult consenting adults is what most people would say. The response to that is, okay, what's a consenting adult? A consenting adult is, by law, X. Okay, so you change the law, and then you just change your line. That's the problem with that one is, okay, so consenting adults are 16. So now you just draw the line at 16. So this line is, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh, you see how it starts becoming more difficult. What if the, age, what if the law says 8? Well, then, well, shit, you can't just change the, the stat. You know, yeah, you can. So if your argument is, well, consenting, then we've already said that children can consent to sexuality. Children can consent to have abortions and have sex. So if they can consent to have sex, why can't they consent to have... If they can consent to have sex with a 12-year-old and they're 12, why can't they consent to have sex with a 60-year-old? Because it's gross. Oh, okay. So all I have to do is convince you it's not gross. Homosexuality is completely gross until you're convinced it's not gross. I mean, I remember in school, people would be like, hey, you fag, yeah. And now, nobody thinks that's gross. Everyone thinks that's just perfectly normal, no big deal. That's fine. You know what? Interracial marriage was considered gross and disgusting and immoral. Nobody blinks twice about that now. Who cares? That's stupid. So if she's Asian and you're black, and who, who cares? Nobody cares about that. So all you have to do is change people's opinion. The Greeks, that's how they all lived. The men had boys. That would follow them around. They'd have sex with the boys all the time. That was considered perfectly normal in the Greek society. Were they enlightened? Are we repressed? Were they disgusting? I, I don't know. I it scares me, though, because I, I, I truly believe there is a difference between children and adults, mentally. I was wondering uh, that, like, society has been here for so long. Like, has there been 
society sort that have gone like all the way to like the oh know, sure the yeah like, yeah like you read in the Old Testament it talks about Sodom uh, you know the city of Sodom and Gomorrah those two cities that were um, where things were wide open sexually uh, the Greeks like I said the Greeks they had two words for love one was love between men and boys and the other was a love between a man and his wife. And the true love was men and boys. The love between a man and his wife was more of a necessity for procreation. It was seen as a, a messy necessity to procreate the species. But true love was between men and boys. And so this is not something new. Men are the problem. No. <laughs> you know, Damn you, men. You know, seriously though, I, I was in I was in um, I was in Pahrump with a client several years ago, probably 15, 20 years ago. I was in Pahrump, and I had a client that was looking at some property, and I went out there to look at the property with them. And we were driving back, and they had these big billboards of prostitution, you know, advertisements, and they've got these very sexy, you know, very provocative billboards. And I remember when I first came to Vegas, all of the sexual, hypersexuality, you're walking down the street, you've got those, you know, those little, whatever they are, the magazine racks, you know, with all the porn in there. With the, you know. And I remember when I first walked by, and when I first came to town, I'm like, what the hell is this? And, and visually, as a man, it would stimulate me. Men are very visually stimulated. I'd be like, wow, look at that. And the billboards, you know, with all the girls, the crazy girls, with, you know, and all that stuff. I would see that stuff, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, where, where are we? And so, and now I, now I just walk by this stuff and I don't notice it, you know, it's just like white noise in the background. But I was in, I was in Pahrump, and I was leaving Pahrump, and I looked up at the billboard, and I go, oh my gosh, how do these people get work done around here with these, these billboards like this? And the guy I was with, he was like 60 years old. And he said, he said, oh, I didn't even notice, really. I said, really? You didn't notice? He goes, he goes you know, i got to tell you, Dale, once you turn 50, the testosterone goes down tremendously, almost overnight, just starts falling off. And he said, it is the most wonderful thing in my life to not have that. And you don't know what it's like to be a man and have testosterone. I'm telling you, it is the most debilitating thing ever. It really is. It controls so much of, your, of who you are and how you think, how you approach the world. Testosterone is a brutal thing. And as I passed 50, he was right. Things change. They really do. And your body, you kind of mellow out a bit. And you're like, oh my gosh, I can start thinking again. You're, cloud you're not clouded with this obsession with sex and aggression. And I mean, it really is a powerful hormone. And, but without that, we would not be at the top of the, 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 talk, top of the, uh, the, the food chain. You know, if men were not obsessed with sex, there'd be a lot less people in this world. If men were not aggressive, we would have been taken over by some, you know, pathetic hairy ape or, you know, whatever it may be, and we would be nowhere else. We, it, because of that, we are where we are. But the backside of that coin is we get all the negatives that come with testosterone as well. Yeah, I, I agree. Men are, to a large degree, a big problem. But we're also a big benefit, you know. Was there another question yet? Um, I was just saying, so like there's studies that actually show you can actually lean someone's sexuality in a different direction. Like yeah. What, yeah. What, 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 they, what they stop short of is saying, I can make somebody that's gay, straight, straight, gay, you know, that sort of thing. What you can do is you can, uh, you, can uh, you know, adjust, skew sexuality. So then the follow-up question is how far, you know? And, I, and, I, and I've heard arguments, and I don't know if this is true, but I've heard arguments where the gateway to homosexuality is, is tran, transgender trannies. You have people who are attracted to women, and then they start looking at porn and stuff with, with guys who dress as women, who are beautiful women, but plumbed as a man, and that that then transitions into gay porn, and then gay porn transitions into... And I've heard some people argue that that's how people go from you know, finding women attractive to finding men attractive. I, 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 I haven't seen any evidence of that, but I, like I said, I've heard people argue that before, which would be an interesting, you know, a, a question to ask gay men and say, 
did you find that you're, you did that in your you know, life? And it would be nice if people were just brutally honest about this. Too, too many people are like, well, no, I've, I've got an agenda. And I'm, no, I mean, if you're honest about that, say, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it happened, or not. No, I didn't. But a lot of people would maybe you know, lie one way or the other because the whole notion of we need to hold true to this, to this argument. And uh, I think that's, I think that's a, a, a possibly a, a dangerous one when you look at the slippery slope. Well, maybe people don't, are not born that way, but maybe they don't choose their sexuality. Maybe, like you said, it's their experiences that they had, yeah. but they can't really like, control it. Well, you know, that, and that's a good point. Do you choose your sexuality, or do you choose other things that lead to it? And let, let me explain what I mean. For example, does anybody choose to be a crack whore? No. Does anybody choose to be 600 pounds? No. No. But you choose to eat, overeat. You choose to do the drug. You choose, I mean, you choose things that lead to something. You know, and those are just negatives, but some things are positive as well, you know. So, so um, I, I, I think possibly, while I may not say I want to be gay, I may say I want to do this, 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 and then the next thing you know, you're now over here and you go, oh look, here I am. And it's a combination of a bunch of other choices that kind of led you there. That's a possibility, I, I don't know. But I, I really don't think it's somebody that sits there and goes, I think I'm going to be straight, or I think I'm going to be gay. I think you have testosterone levels, you have predispositions. Of, I mean, there's, there you have the whole spectrum of masculine and feminine traits. You have people that are very feminine, uh, very feminine traits that are straight and gay, and you have people that are very masculine traits that are both straight and gay, right? But when you take those traits, you find a larger disproportionate number of feminine-traded men tend to be gay, and a larger disproportionate of masculine trait men tend to be straight. So that's one of, obviously one of the factors. And then sexual experiences, social norms, religion. I mean, there's a bunch of other things that play into this, including, I think, your behaviors. If you, I, I really think if you go like that, that path of you know, women, tranny, that sort of thing, I think they'd be much more inclined, somebody who may be a little more on the, you know, one way or the other, that would be choices that could possibly lead there. I don't know. I mean, I haven't done studies, I'm just practically speaking, and I, I don't know. But again, I, I, think it's, I think it's way more complex. And when people just try to go, oh, no, it's, it's simple, it's easy, I'm born that way, I've always been gay, or I've always been straight, I go, no, you're not. No, you're not. I guarantee you that you would be turned on of somebody of the opposite sex under certain circumstances. I think that uh, that's absolutely. true. If you can choose, hey, guy told me that. Uh, yeah, I, no, I he did. No, he he was like, "You're so pretty. I would be straight for you." I was like, okay. Yeah, yeah, it happens. Yeah. It happens. I think happens. that if you are able to choose to go down the sleeper slope, you can also choose to go the other way. Yeah. Where it's like, like nothing more. I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we, uh, we can choose a lot of things. You know, the argument uh, uh, that, that people make is, well, you can be gay your whole life or you can be straight your whole life. Um, uh, well, actually, the argument is you can be gay your whole life and live a straight life. But no one would ever say you can be uh, what is it? Straight, straight. straight your whole life and live gay. Well, why not? Right? Why can't you be? And they would say, well, because you can't, you can't be, you can't, you, you're, if you're attracted to men, then you're gay. No, not necessarily. Right? I mean, women, you see it all the time with women. With women, it's much more acceptable. Women openly are like, oh, no, I, she's, she's gorgeous. I'd have sex with her. But I'm straight. Women are much more open with sexuality. Well, and I think also because it's something that it's been already accepted much easier than... That's right. Than look, at, look at porn. How many, how many porns do you see where men are having sex with each other? None. How many porns do you see where women are having sex with each other with men? Tons. Now, because it's much more acceptable in society. So does that mean that it's, it's, we're born more that way? No, I mean, this is, these are just social norms. Now that, on that TV, we're you're seeing more 
scenes with guys, and it's like, why are they adding all this extra stuff? Well, yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable for us to see because we haven't seen it. But the more you, the more exposure, the less it's, it's going to be uncomfortable, and it'll be no big deal. I mean, that's just really what happens. And that's why when she was saying, it's gross, I'm thinking, okay, now it is. So what? It won't be gross in a little bit. Yeah, I was thinking when you said that, like, um, in the future, 20, 30 years from now, we're going to be like the, the, the bad ones. I was yeah. thinking that's a lot like in parenting. Uh, you, might think, you, think, you might think that you did so much better than your parents. That's right. Than your children. My mom used to beat the crap out of me. You know, and she did way better than her dad did. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and then I think, well, that was horrible, and my kids are going to go, I can't believe my dad did X, Y, and Z, and I'm much more enlightened, and I don't know what's right, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing that I, you know, I, I, I point That's out. Crazy. And uh, and hopefully people take it for what it, what it's meant. You know, I, I, I always wonder when I go over this if people think I'm being, you know, judgmental or obnoxious or difficult and I you know I, I, I'm always cautious because I, I don't I hope people don't think that I'm just one thing challenging was, notions one thing that I was thinking of like I wasn't thinking of like the the, the arguments for it well, I was thinking well a, a lot of the stuff that's happening I'm thinking well if it doesn't hurt anybody or if it doesn't have anything to do with me like it None of my business, it right? It doesn't matter. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, but, and, and, and that's what most people say. But when you say it doesn't hurt anybody, that's where the tough, tough line is. Because what, how do you define hurting somebody? Is a 60-year-old having sex with a 10-year-old hurting him? That's a tough, it, it's just... right? I mean, we would say, well, absolutely. Okay, what about a 15-year-old? Well, yeah. yeah. What about a 16-year-old? Well, it depends on the state. Oh, okay, really? So... It, then all of a sudden we say it's okay? I don't know. It's interesting though, right? Yeah, because the age of consent is different. And across the world it's different. You go to some of the, the Middle Eastern countries, age of consent is eight. Is that really what we want? It scares me. I really think that that children should be considered under 21. I think it's unfair that we allow 18-year-old girls to be signing up and doing porn. That, that, that's, that's, you're taking advantage of children in my estimation. 18-year-olds aren't smart enough to know what's going on. I can manipulate the hell out of an 18-year-old. And so, but I understand it's a sliding scale. Some 18-year-olds are gonna be much more savvy than others. What do we do as a society when you have to draw lines? And write laws. I don't know. Why Hope, this, this is this. Let me just say this is why we can't allow society to or the laws to determine what society believes morally, because you can't. The law can never address all the specifics and draw the line properly. Society needs its own norms. Society needs morals and ethics that it typically gets from religion. That's where society, the law should have the outskirts, the edges of, of society, where you really have crossed the line. And the rest of that stuff should be dealt with amongst families and religion and culture and norms, where society kind of runs itself, and somebody steps out this line, and the law says, oh, you've gone too far, and we, you knock you down. But the problem is we've eliminated that notion to some degree based on your, your racist, sexist, biased, and you know, condescending and obnoxious. So we're going to have the law step in and define everything, and that's tough. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. So it's like a separation, of church and state. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we've we've what we've done with separation of church and state is we've said we're going to eliminate any sort of religion. Um, that the government can't acknowledge any religion. That's different than the government establishing a religion. And so you have the Establishment Clause, which says that you know, the government can't establish a state-run religion. Can't say we are officially a Christian nation. That's right. But can they say, can they allow religious stuff to go on? That's a different question. We've pushed back on that. So you know, like things like in God we trust, that that's establishing theism over atheism. 
Well, I, I would say, no, this country was established as a theistic country. You, know, you read the founding fathers, you read the documents, it all says God, you know, inalienable rights from God. This is, this is, a, this is a country based on theists. Now, you may think that that's wrong, but that's the truth of it. It was based on that. So do we then try to say, well, we're going to establish a country based on atheism? Then I would say, that how is that different than theism? Your religion of science is no different than somebody's religion of God. You're just substituting a belief in one for a belief in the other. 